three-part series talking about disappointments. I know it's three parts because I only have three Wednesdays. <laughs> so it's going to be three parts. <laughs> so uh, how we'll go is we will go until it gets to be about time, and then we'll just stop. Um, so there's, there's a few things that could be said about disappointments. Uh, first off, life is really filled with life and death. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. It really is how do we look at it. Um, to overemphasize either is kind of just foolish. You know, sometimes we get in life where we just think about death. You know, it's like it's all we can think of. You know, maybe we've lost a lot of people or maybe we're sick or whatever, and all we can think of is death. That's not happening. But then sometimes we also go through life and kind of pretend like death doesn't exist, like we're going to live forever and we just start doing stupid stuff, and that's not very smart either. So, you know, you have to kind of, kind of embrace both in order not to be blindsided by disappointments. Um, everyone must go through disappointments. Never feel like this is something that you and you alone are going through. Uh, never feel like when a disappointment happens, like, oh, I didn't expect that. Just expect disappointments in life. I, I'm not saying look for the gray in every, I'm not saying that. <laughs> I'm not saying look for the worst case scenario in every single situation. But at the same time, when disappointments do come, you have to realize that they're going to come. Um, so, however, God is, you know, God's really cool. He's just really cool. So, he does this, this process, which sometimes might seem to us circuitous, but he, he has this process of bringing such wonderful things through things that we never imagined. I don't know how he does it, but uh, he just does it all the time. Um, it starts off with a dream, something that you hope to happen, or maybe even something that God's put in your heart. Okay? It can really be anything, and I'm sure if you've been alive for more than five years, you, you have had <coughs> dreams. <laughs> so then, throughout the process of this, our dreams die. You know, whatever happens, I don't, I don't care what. It's just something happens that causes the dream to die. And then God comes into that situation, and then out of nowhere, a new purpose is given to this, and you see your dead dreams blossom. I don't know how he does this, but God's just good in ways that I, I don't get. I really don't get. Um, really, the Bible is, is full of examples like this. Okay, here's, here's just an example. Joseph had a dream that he was going to you know, be a leader and great things. He's, God was going to use him for great things. And then the death of the dream, he got sold into slavery. And so he worked his way up into slavery, and he got put into prison. So he worked his way up into prison, and he ended up, ended up in Pharaoh's house. So the death of the dream plus God equaled... Joseph's dream was fulfilled in a greater capacity than he would have ever thought. Um, you know, the Bible's really full of this. Um, if you look in John 11, uh, you'll see another example of this. Starts with verse 1, and I hear people turning there, so I'll wait till y'all get there. John chapter 11, starting in verse 1. And all the people with the phones are already there. <laughs> yeah, those of you who use your phones, you have to use those um, those artificial page flipper sounds. You know the ones that <laughs> where it was, you know, so that people know that you've gone somewhere. Um, <laughs> now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, in the village of Mary, um, and Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord's appointment. <coughs> and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. So the sisters sent word to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved uh, Martha and her, sister, uh, and her sister and Lazarus. <coughs> so when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Um, then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you are going there again? Jesus answered, <coughs> are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. This he said, and after that he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. And the disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, 
but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. <coughs> so Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, so that you may be there. But let us go to him. Therefore Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, so we may die with him. So when she... <laughs> Uh, anyways, so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been. <laughs> oh my goodness! Okay, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to consult them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him. But Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, "Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give to you." Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who, lo who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I have believed that you are the Christ, the Son of God, even he who comes into the world. When Jesus had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, and saying secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met, uh, met him. So are you guys kind of seeing the picture here? Okay, we've got Jesus knows these people, the brother dies, the sisters are obviously upset, so he comes. It's been multiple days since this is going on. It seems like Jesus doesn't even care. So then he gets there, and even when he gets into town, he's still out there where Martha met him. And Martha goes into town, and Jesus still is over there. Like, he's really not in that big of a hurry. <laughs> so now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Then, in verse 31, Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, uh, when Mary uh, came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, <clears throat> saying to him, Lord, if you, have, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. You know, is there an echo in here? <laughs> uh, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews were saying, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man also from dying? So Jesus again, see, if you notice, everybody is on board with the idea that Jesus has some kind of power. They're not really acknowledging from, but okay, so he has some form of power, but just not all power. See, they're acknowledging the fact that if he had gotten there sooner, you could have killed him. But now that he's dead, there's nothing that he can do. Mm -hmm. Do you see what they're saying? Okay. Even Mary and Martha are saying the same thing. For if you look over here, um, okay, so even though she's in verse 21, uh, no, I'm sorry, 22, even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Not, not that you'll rise him from the dead, but you know. That even though you didn't come through this time, if you ask God for something in the future, he'll I know he'll answer you. See, everybody's skirting around the issue, thing, assuming that Jesus is not able to do this thing. So Jesus, again being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Remove the stone. And Martha, the sister of the, of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for it has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, "Father, I thank you that you were ha that you have heard me. I knew that you all, I knew that you always hear me. But because uh, of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me." When he said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come forth!" The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, "Unbind him and let him go." Therefore, many of the Jews who came to Mary and saw what he had done, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them the things which Jesus had done. Now we'll stop there. But you kind of get the flow of what's happening here. And, and I read this because we're going to be looking at this story throughout the next couple weeks, um, in part at least. Uh, but here we have the death of a dream. Okay, The dream is, God, you can heal my brother. But then the death of the dream, literally, he dies. Um, it's not often that the death of the dream actually is death, but hey... Kill two birds with one stone. So, okay. Uh, and then God shows up, and then this is created with purpose. See, Jesus purposely let him die just so that he could show them his power. Yes. Sometimes.
sometimes God does that too, you know. <clears throat> sometimes God lets your dream die so that he can show power. You, you know that, right? Okay, so um, in World War I, there was this thing called shell shock. Now they, they've changed the name now. Now it's post-traumatic stress disorder, which really covers a lot of different things. Um, the thing I want to talk about specifically is, is shell shock. So in World War I, when, when in fighting and stuff, uh, they kind of – there was this phase in, in the fighting where, where people kind of just go a little crazy uh, during the fight, and uh, sometimes they would even kill their fellow soldiers too. Um, just because of the shock of, of everything, all that bad stuff that was happening in World War One, uh, was just a little bit too much uh, to process mentally, which I think you can understand. Um, in the older days, um, they I think they just called it blood craze. Um, it's where you would be fighting with your infantry troops, and they have their swords and whatnot, and then sometimes you'd have soldiers who are too young for something, and they just kind of snap mentally on the battlefield and just start swinging crazy. Um, and the same kind of thing can happen with disappointment. You know, uh, something where you really weren't anticipating it, and you feel totally caught off guard, and so because of your hurt, you just start swinging blindly, you know, and uh, taking out your, your comrades and stuff, and, and, and a lot of that kind of stuff. You know, some of the physical stuff that we go through is very much so um, mirrored in the in our physical lives. Um, but disappointments, um, they do come, and when they catch us off guard, it can cause all kinds of bad responses. Uh, disappointments come from unmet expectations. The idea is that I expect for something to happen, or I want very strongly for something to happen. If it doesn't, then that's when disappointment happens. So I went to college with this with this uh, guy, and, and his solution for not being disappointed was simply don't hope. <laughs> he said, "Well, I, yeah, I'm just going to get let." He, <laughs> we called him Eeyore. <laughs> he, he always moped around. <laughs> not the same now, but I mean, when he was in college, that's how it was. Um, and so he always had this idea, you know, don't look for the silver lining because you're just going to be disappointed. So just anticipate the worst case happening in every situation. And oh man, it was a downer, guys. It was a downer. Have you, have you guys familiar with Winnie the Pooh? Where, yes. where you're just kind of, why bother, you know? <laughs> uh, anyways, and uh, you know, sometimes we can go into a state like that where, where, you know, I've had so many disappointments or I'm just afraid to lose. You know, a part of myself, something I love, someone I love. And so we try to just distance ourselves uh, from expectations of many kinds that we don't get disappointed. Um, and, and leadership books, they tell you as a leader that if you want to avoid um, people being disappointed with you as a leader, um, the easiest solution is to tell them. <laughs> no, that's not what <laughs> Is to tell them what to expect. You know, like when you become a new pastor at a new church and you don't know the people, this is what you can expect from me, and what what can I expect from you? You know, to so kind of have a little bit of dialogue, and that that clarity kind of resolves the disappointments. But with a lot of life, you really can't do that. I mean, you can't sit God down and say, okay, this is what I'm expecting of you, and I, you know, it doesn't really work the same way. And so in the real world, you know, aside from leadership in the real world, um, dis disappointments are going to come. And uh, no matter how hard you try, you will have expectations that are not met. And the point isn't that you don't hope. <coughs> the point is that you hope in the right things. There's a very big difference there. Um, I have some notes somewhere on here, and I don't – I want them displayed, but it won't show them. Well, I guess I could keep it like that, and I could keep, see yeah. my notes too. Yeah. Okay, whatever. Um, I forget that this is Windows 7. I'm used to using Windows 8, so I'm not quite sure how to get it to do what I want it to do. Anyways, um, the, the solution isn't to not hope. The solution is to hope in the right things. Like, for instance, you'll see my note, hope in God, hope in salvation, the, the things that are certain. But uh, when, when we just kind of pick things erroneously to hope in, like, for instance, if you're familiar with televangelists, you'll know something called um, prosperity doctrine. Where they basically say that if you just name it and claim it, you can get rich. So there's the, there's the hope. There's there's the expectation there. So then people <coughs> try it, and they're let down. So the obvious uh, point there being they weren't hoping in the right thing. And uh, whenever you're dealing with disappointments, we're going to look specifically at three areas. Sickness, death, and betrayal. Excuse me. 
whenever you're going with a disappointment in life, really outlook is the key. You know, how you approach things depends how you're going to be able to resolve those issues. Um, as an example, um, if you're going with it, if, you, if you're faced with a situation, you're already a little bit down in the dumps, and, and so then this new situation faces you, you're not going to really be thinking about solutions for your problem. I mean, you're just going to be thinking about what was me, which is a natural process. I'm not trying to beat you up if you're there. Um, but really how you approach something, like in, in a lot of leadership things, they always talk about this. Don't say, I have to pastor this church. Say, I get to pastor this church. It's a little, it's a little phrase difference, but it makes a big difference in your head. And what I mean by that is little things that seem like chores can become good things with the right outlook. So, uh, I'll have to just keep going back and forth, I guess. So, in, uh, in the first thing I want to look at, the first disappointment is sickness. I don't know how far we're going to make it into this, but uh, we're already in John chapter 11, so just flip back just uh, two chapters. And then in John chapter 9, starting in verse 1 and going through the verse 3, it says, As he passed by, he saw a, blind, um, a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? Jesus answered, It was neither that this man sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. So there's a few things that I want to point out. The first, and I think that this is incredibly important whenever you're going through sickness, don't just assume it's your fault. Don't just assume that I did something wrong and now I'm being punished. Don't hop there immediately. Okay. Now, if God speaks to your heart and he says, you know, I did this, you did this, you know, and he starts talking to you, that's, that's different. But don't assume every single time you get sickness. Like, I've seen a lot of people who, they get cancer. So what have I done to get cancer? Well, life happened. I mean, <laughs> not every time that you get sick is it some, you know, a vengeful spirit or God trying to take it out on you. I mean, honestly, come on. <coughs> Even if you read the Bible... You can come to this conclusion on your own, but if you read the Bible, it, it, it talks about this. There's lots of reasons for getting sick. But with that being said, God uses both our healing and our sickness to display his work. See, so sometimes he heals in an instant, and we like it when he does that. Sometimes he, he heals through a process of going to the doctors and tests and more tests and more tests, and we don't like that too much, but at least there's healing. Then sometimes he doesn't heal at all. And he uses that not healing in ways that we never understand. Now, see, that's the one I have a problem with. Because it's like, give me results or give me death. Don't really give me death, <laughs> but give me results. You know? and, and God doesn't really work on, on our time frame. You know? And it's hard to, to kind of let go and to let God you know, have that. Because he is the one in control. We like to... God, this is how it has to be. You can only get glory from this situation if you resolve it like this. And meanwhile, God is saying, no, I can get glory in it from a multitude of ways. Now, let me show you. <laughs> you know, um, I, here's, a, here's a great example. There was a woman uh, that Gracie knew when she was a teenager who got cancer. And, uh, I mean, they, they kept fighting, kept fighting. It just, it just was not going away. Um, even when they thought it would go away, it would resurface. I think she ended up getting it again for and anyway, so this is a long, painful process. That woman always had a smile on her face. She was always happy. She always talked to people about God. She was always talking about how God had blessed her. See, God left the sickness and used it in a way that you never would anticipate God being able to use it. See, I don't know why sometimes God makes us suffer almost pointlessly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand that. But God does. And we have to come to a place of saying, you know what, that, that's okay that God knows and I don't. Um, another point here, um, sometimes we do the exact same thing with a child. My child is an illness because of me. For those of you who have had babies that you, they were born and had complications, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <clears throat> this is something that I did, and that's why my child, I mean, punished from on behalf of my child. Maybe, but I mean, don't hop there immediately. Another example is, you know, my grown child is on drugs because of me. I didn't do a good enough job parenting or film the blank. And it's like, well, no, no, that's, that's actually not, not as true there. Um, 
I know it's sometimes hard to absolve yourself of guilt and to let something go, but sometimes that's the only real solution because it's the truth. You know, and I know that's hard. And sometimes as parents, we don't like to hear that because we want to know that it's something we can fix. But uh, sometimes you can't fix it. <laughs> and that's hard, but sometimes that's just the way it is. Um, so if you'll turn to Matthew chapter, well, you don't have to turn there, uh, but Matthew chapter 9. You can turn there if you wish. I'm not telling you not to. Do whatever you want. Live your life. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9. <laughs> verse 2. <laughs> Matthew chapter 9, verse 2. It says this. And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes said to themselves, This fellow blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why are you thinking evil in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up and walk? Now see, this, this is a little bit of a trick question, because on the surface, it, it's easier to say, I forgive you of your sins, because there's no visible proof to say that I'm wrong. But the truth is, that saying get up in your, and walk is harder because, I mean, you, you, get where I'm, you get where he's going with this? So, okay, but so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the paralytic, get up and pick up your bed and go home. I think they kind of proved his point. <laughs> but um, I was reading a book by Ted Decker. It was called, uh, I think it was called A Child Called Blessed or Blessed Child or something like that. Something, something like that. Anyways, uh, he wrote it uh, probably about 15 years ago or so. Um, and there's this thing that's repeated a bunch of times in the book, and that's this. Whoever said that healing um, – how did he word it? Um, that healing um, a limb was more significant than healing the heart. And he says this like a bunch of times throughout the book because it's this child who, who you know, has these miracle powers and he's able to heal people. And he keeps, telling, he keeps telling the crowd, it, it's kind of like a modern-day Jesus kind of situation. Not, not quite, but just to kind of put it in, in focus here. Um, and uh, he keeps talking to the crowd and asking them this. Well, whoever said that, it, that it's more significant to be healed physically than to have your heart healed? And that's kind of exactly what Jesus is saying here. The more important healing is forgiveness of sins. I think that sometimes we downplay that healing because we want a physical healing. And I think that that's a very big um, – well, first off, I think it, it, it's somewhat – not to put it too harsh, but somewhat blasphemous because, I mean, God forgave us of our sins. And then to just trample over that like that's not important, I mean, let's keep things in perspective. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't mean to put that too harsh. Um, but either way, you know, and, and, and sometimes we just kind of feel like, you know, God, if you don't heal me physically, you've really let me down. And uh, – I don't think that God has that same uh, mindset about it. Um, Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 through 17 says this. When Jesus came into Peter's home, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and waited on him. When evening came, they brought, you know, that's so like a mom. That is what a mom would do. I mean, guys, come on, really. In the old days. Forget that. My mom would still do that today. <laughs> when evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a sword and healed all who were ill. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. He himself took our infirmities and carried our diseases. So this is a very important point that I feel like we kind of just skip over. Some illnesses are self-inflicted. Some aren't. That's okay. Because so what people do is we try and qualify what God will or won't do. He won't heal me because it's self-inflicted. Or he can't heal me because it's self-inflicted. Or he's going to teach me a lesson first, you know, so you can rub it in that I shouldn't have done whatever it is that caused you to have this physical, you know, uh, problem. But the, but the truth is God, God is in control of all sickness, and nothing is too big. And it doesn't matter if a problem is self-inflicted or just came on you throughout the course of life. God, it said, right here, Jesus was healing everything, regardless of the cause. You know, and, and I think that we sometimes overlook that. God can, God can still heal us um, regardless of whether it was self-inflicted or not. You know, and, and it's not like, oh, no, you know, uh, 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 John needs to learn a lesson from this injury, so I'm not going to heal him. <laughs> Take that, John. 
<laughs> you know, I, God, God's not like that. <laughs> uh, okay. Matthew 9, 2. It says, And they brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. We already read this part, but I just want to focus on something here. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. So, sometimes we don't find healing spirit... I'm sorry, sometimes... I said that wrong. Sometimes we don't find healing spiritually, mentally, or physically because we're living in sin. Now, I want to give that... Before I elaborate, I just want to kind of stop real quick and go back to what I said about don't assume <laughs> that it's sin. <laughs> okay? Great. Oh, sorry, it's this thing here. It's a little bit loose sometimes. And so it kind of has... A there we go. Um, give it a second. It's still thinking about it, guys. Okay. <laughs> and sometimes we have sickness because of technology, and we punch the screen. We shouldn't have punched the screen, you know? so God probably just wants us to learn how to control our temper. <laughs> just kidding. I'm joking. Anyways, um, so going back to the whole thing that I already said about, you know, it, it, don't just assume that, oh, I did something wrong, and that's, I'm being punished with the sickness, so, okay. But sometimes we don't find healing spiritually, mentally, or physically because we are living in sin. Um, I, I deal with a lot of people with anxiety. Obviously, I have anxiety. And so sometimes people who are living um, just in, in a very not good place will have more mental issues. And you know, then they want to say, no, I'm going to keep living how I want. And it's like, well, you can't. I mean, this is the result of the life you're living in. Uh, just a few examples I can think of off the top of my head. Using a lot of depressants, like alcohol. I mean, surely you can see how you're going to struggle with depression when you're on depressants. I mean, that just makes sense, right? It's not something that I really have to think real hard about. Um, or if I'm using, you know, certain other <laughs> medications that I'm not going to name, uh, you might see how I could have more problems with anxiety. You know, things like that. Um, or if I'm living kind of just sleeping around with people, surely you can see how this could make me have a little bit of a nervous you know, um, temperament. You see, you see what I'm getting at? This? Sometimes we're, we're, we want to live in a sin and then we want God to just kind of take away the effects of living in our sin without actually changing our lives. And that just, that doesn't work for God. Um, he doesn't kind of, he doesn't like wait for us to just say the magic words of incantation and he's going to do whatever we command him to do. I mean, that's just not how things work in the real world. Now, going back to Matthew chapter 8 again, uh, verses 5 through 6. And when Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him, imploring him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, fearfully tormented. Now, Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion said, Lord, I am not worthy for you to come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. And we'll stop there. Uh, even if God doesn't heal, take it to God first. I, there's a lot of things I want to say here, and I'm trying to... Kind of <laughs> we kind of think that the only benefit of taking something to God is if he heals us for it immediately. Right. Like if he doesn't heal us at that moment, exactly right now, supernaturally gone, that it was like wasted prayer. You know, um, but what we see here with the centurion is his servant had a problem. He went straight to Jesus. See, there was a problem. He went straight to Jesus. And the idea here is, it, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter as much as much. Now I know for people who are suffering with sicknesses, it's hard to hear that it doesn't matter. But I don't mean it like that. It doesn't matter as much if a healing comes so much as there's a dependence. That's that's the real difference. Because, I mean, like, for instance, take take my dad's hernia surgery, okay? So my dad had a hernia, and didn't he pray for it? Well, why didn't God just heal him? Is it his lack of faith that God didn't heal him? So, I mean, sometimes God uses other things, but the moral story being, pastor had faith in God, foremost. And if God would have told him, no, don't go to the doctor, I'm going to heal you supernaturally, he would have said, okay. You know, he, he, it wasn't an issue of faith. Pastor trusts God, and he did what he thought he should. So, do you get kind of what I'm going here? The idea isn't so much that God supernaturally heals us in that moment. 
the idea is that we have a dependence on God. And when you're sick, that's hard to do. <sighs> that's hard to do. Because <laughs> you wake up with this every day. It's not like it's gone away somewhere. Uh, John 9, 6-7 We'll probably end on this slide, I'm thinking. John 9, 6-7 says, When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle. <laughs> I like that word, spittle. <laughs> and applied the clay. <laughs> I'm a guy, it's okay. <laughs> you know, guys, did you notice that guys never really mature? We get bigger, <laughs> but we really never mature. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I, I see 50-year-old men still saying, ha, ha, I farted. 50-year-old <laughs> men, guys. <laughs> men don't mature. We just get bigger. <laughs> okay, so I'm sorry. That was, that was, that was back on track. John chapter 9, verse 6 to 7 says, When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and applied the clay to his eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went away and washed and came back seeing. Now, Jesus could have just touched his eyes. He could have just commanded the eyes to see, and they would have. But instead, he uses this process. So it brings me to another point. Continue to trust God through whatever physical treatment. Mm -hmm. That's hard when you're on dialysis. That's hard when you're on cancer treatments. Mm -hmm. To keep trusting in God when you're <coughs> taking these terrible medications that are making you feel like crap, that's hard. That's hard. That's really, really hard. But um, it, it's something that, you know, God works through things, and I don't know if he's going to bring you healing or not. I, I don't know. But I do know that he can. I do know that he's capable of it. And I do know that if he never asks, he never will. <laughs> um, so Luke chapter 8, verse 43, 43 through 44, says... And a woman who had a hemorrhage for twelve years and could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one who touched me? And while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing in on you. And we'll stop there. Uh, so it, 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 I feel like we kind of skip over that first part. Hmm. Do what you can, because God can use doctors. If, 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 if help is accessible to you, go get that help. I mean, honestly, don't, don't send yourself to the grave early because you just didn't want to take care of yourself. You know, I see a lot of people who, once they reach a certain age, they don't want to even try eating healthy. They don't even want to try. You know, so then they have the effects of not eating healthy. And I mean, guys, you, you, you guys all know that the food that you eat, it's, once you hit like 23, Everything that you eat starts hitting all your joints, and you're like, ah, ah what happened? I was young once. Uh, just last week, I don't know what happened. Um, so anyways, it says that she did go, and she did try to get help, but she went to Jesus also. Now, obviously, Jesus was there 12 years ago to right. heal her. So that's important. So once again, go to God first. Before you do anything, always go to God first. But with that being said, don't neglect this. Do what you can. Sometimes we, we like to just kind of skip that step in the process and immediately go to the hem of the garment when it's like, well, don't forget that she struggled with that for 12 years. 12 years, guys. That's a really, really, really long time to deal with, with, with the sickness. Um, so uh, we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, can I have...